I live in a nuclear family setup and my husband was traveling for a week. I was handling my work, the household and my three-year-old all alone. I was running low on patience this particular evening and there were multiple meltdowns from my daughter. A lot of yelling, kicking, screaming, no, I will not, I want that right now and tears. If you witnessed a meltdown, you can possibly imagine how exhausting it was for the both of us. With a lot of warm hugs, cuddles and I love yous, we made up and turned in for the night. After bedtime reading, I told her that we needed to figure out a solution. The next morning, she woke me up at 6 a.m. visibly excited. She said, Hey Amma, I thought, I know you scold me for a reason, but I still hate it. So the next time I'm having a tantrum, I want you to hug me. I stared at her and asked her if she was sure, because she's someone who hates being touched without permission. She thought some more and said, Yes, I don't like it, but I think it'll be okay when I'm upset. So you can hug me. Hearing her calmly self-evaluate, rationalize and arrive at a suitable compromise made me wonder about an ability that I lack as an adult at times. This is why working on childhood experiences is important. Whether we have children of our own or not, how we interact with children largely affects us, children themselves and generations to come. When I was pregnant with my daughter, I thought I could breeze through taking care of a young child. How difficult could it be? After all, it is the one thing our species has been doing consistently over the years, right? I decided to read parenting guides and found books on how to raise bilingual kids, how to raise intelligent kids, how to be a happy parent, how to be a mindful parent, Danish ways of parenting, Chinese ways of parenting and the whole lot. It was overwhelming. When I think about why it seems so complicated, it hits me that millennial parents possibly have it the toughest. The world is changing at a pace faster than our own and we're aware of it. We also know deep down that children of today need to be successful, but also kind and happy. Or perhaps we're just the first generation to realize how important parenting is and say gutsily, dude, this gig is hard. So within a month of delivering my daughter, I realized that although there are guides on what different colors of baby poop mean, and what the pros and types of cloth diapers are, nothing in the world will prepare you for a poop explosion in your face when you're changing your infant's diaper. True story. So I learned the hard way that real life parenting is winging it and struggling to survive on a daily basis. But is that what we really want to do? Survive? Why not find a way to thrive in this and make the most for children in these crucial years of their lives? Why not make this period the most meaningful for us as well. The human brain, like we now know, is capable of neural plasticity, meaning it can change its shape and neural connections based on the stimuli of learning and experience. Although the brain continues to rewire itself well into adulthood and until we die, its rate is the highest in childhood. As I navigated the daily grind, I realized that applying the scientific learning approach in parenting made a lot of sense. You can call this by any name, but it all boils down to the simple principle, treating the child with respect. How it has made our lives more meaningful has to be seen to be believed. As a high school teacher, when I looked at my class, I wouldn't be able to predict how successful my children would be in the future. But when I walked into a classroom, I could tell which child's emotional bucket was full and which of them needed extra support from me. A scientist named Harlow once separated baby monkeys from their mothers at birth. He put these baby monkeys in cages containing two surrogate mothers, one made of wood and one made of terry cloth. One was hard and cold, while the other was warm and soft. He then placed food with the wooden surrogate in some sets and the terry mother in others. What do you think happened? The baby monkeys always preferred the warm surrogate made of terry, irrespective of which one held the food. Harlow's experiment with monkeys only reinforces the importance of emotional connect in the early years. Children obviously crave emotional connect. But on a scientific level, we need to develop something called mirror neurons. These neurons are the reason we feel thirsty when we see someone drink water, or what motivates a baby to mimic the funny faces her father makes. 
although research is still ongoing about these neurons, it is believed that these neurons are at the core of developing empathy. Hmm. This now means that the kinds of relationships children experience in the early years forms the basis of how they will relate to others throughout their lives. This does not just include parents, but widens the pool to caregivers, educators, teachers, nannies, grandparents, aunties, uncles, neighbors, even a co-passenger on the bus or the swiggy uncle who comes to deliver food. When children spend quality time interacting with these people, they no doubt learn people skills like communication, sharing, understanding non-verbal cues, accepting differences. But they also learn something extremely important about themselves, whether relationships leave them feeling anxious and alone or secure and focused. Let us consider newborns. Despite everything including the amniotic fluid they're floating in changing the minute they're born, they're ready to absorb the world. When caregivers are attuned to the infant's needs, babies link it to how they feel about the world. They can learn to be open to others' ideas and accepting or reject everything and be self-centered. This association can form long-lasting schemas within the brain. So how does one be attuned to a child's needs? With respect, of course. Specifically, respectful communication. Consider a mundane task like circling back to changing a baby's diaper. One could pick the baby, change the diaper, dunk the baby back into the crib, all the while listening to a podcast. Or one could say, hey, the diaper is full, hence I need to change it. Give a moment for the child to process the information, picking the baby up and changing the diaper gently, all the while maintaining eye contact and talking the child through the process. Basically, if you are exceptionally kind, gentle and respectful to children, they would imbibe the same and recognize any behavior otherwise, from self or others, as different. We must respect the child's pace. Instead of forcing a child to learn ABCs or numbers that don't make sense yet, how about listening to their questions and nudging them in directions they find answers for themselves? For example, sorting onions and potatoes in the kitchen, free math, picking up leaves while on nature walks, free science, stories in the mother tongue, language, conversations about day and night, social science. Even the simple act of putting a rangoli outside the door can be great lessons in color, motor play, sensory play, symmetry, geometry, color mixing, culture studies, etc. Apart from this, we also need to respect the child's intelligence. Remember how as kids we fall down and the first reaction we get be, Oh no, poor baby, let's hit the ground, you'll feel better. Apart from being a totally unrelated cause and effect, this reaction not only teaches children that it's okay to blame others, but promotes the thought that violence can make things better for us. We need to believe that the child can handle reality and say, Hey, you were running and you tripped. It happens. I'm here for you. Maybe you can be a little more careful the next time. Similarly, we need to respect the child's needs. A child running around the house and climbing the window grills 98 times a day, true story again, may not necessarily be hyperactive but be in the developmental period for movement. How radical it would be if we focus on satisfying these developmental needs instead of labeling and cribbing about a child's behavior. Similarly, we need to respect the child's ability. There is no greater confidence than independence. Let us let the child help themselves. Instead of stuffing a child with food, we can provide child-sized cutlery and step stools and trust the child to be able to eat and clean up after themselves. We should also respect the child's perspective. When one provides rich experiences to children, be it through travel or diverse books, the child's perspective of seeing beauty in everything, same or different, is preserved. Lastly, we must respect the child's personal space. Remember as children how random uncles and aunties would walk up to us, pinch our cheeks and say, what a cute child. Or we'd be misbehaving and suddenly a whack would come out of nowhere. Both needs to be avoided because we need to respect the child's autonomy over their own body. We need to take permission before unwarranted touches so that the child grows up with the same respect for personal space. Maybe we could handle tantrums with a little more grace and patience? I know what you're thinking. Hey, 
When a child is wailing and acting like a jerk in public, wouldn't a whack just shut them up? Well, here's the thing. Children do not possess the mechanism to regulate their behavior. In fact, that mechanism keeps developing until we're 25 years of age. So they're not necessarily acting like a jerk on purpose. Now you're thinking, okay, but we got spanked all the time and we turned out fine. Did we? Would we be okay backing off friends or partners when they're being unreasonable? Would we be okay being beaten today as adults for merely having a difference of opinion? Did we really turn out fine if we think children can be treated any differently? Now you're thinking, okay, this is great for children. What about us adults then? Is it too late for us? The brain can be rewired with practice. We can direct our thoughts in certain ways and thus be more mindful. When I started stepping back with my daughter, I was able to see her for what she really is. A person with a brain that allows her to think, feel and experience. A person who will grow into an adult molded by these very emotions and experiences. Being mindful of my interactions with her has made me more mindful of my own inner space and interactions with others. When my three-year-old daughter argues with me with impeccable logic and arrives at a compromise through butting head situation we might be having, I have to concede, gulp my ego and meet her midway. I have to let go of my illusions of control and live with the choices she makes. I realize how small I am in the larger scheme of things. It all comes down to being tolerant, accepting ideas however different they are from my own or accepting ideas from however young a person they come from. It, hang on, does this mean just letting go, giving in to all their demands? No, it means stepping back but being mindful and hovering around watchfully. It means presenting children with reasonable choices without overwhelming them. For example, I don't ask my toddler what do you want for dinner when I know she'll say cake without batting an eyelid. I ask her, hey, would you like to help me make upma or chapatis? I'm following through because it means respecting her choices. Uh, you might ask if this will work with all kids and all families. Why not? Every family sitting is different, but we all want to raise better kids. We all want to provide better experiences for our kids. A joint family setup may provide for great people skills. A house on the highway is an amazing way to learn about city life, occupations or traffic rules. Living close to nature provides for great ways to learn about botany, agriculture or zoology firsthand. As long as we have an open mind, we will be able to give children the chance they deserve. Let us start looking at children for what they truly are, a spark of infinite potential. Let us allow them to shine bright. Let us let them bloom into the best versions of themselves. Let us start treating them the way we would like to be treated, with kindness and respect. As Daniel Siegel says, parenting matters even to the extent of influencing our inborn and genetically shaped ability. Thank you.